Welcome everybody and good morning. Welcome to day three. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining us online in all of your different time zones and times of the day. And welcome to everybody who's joining us here in Mianjin, Brisbane at the Queensland Conservatorium. We hope you have been having the most stimulating three, day, three days of the year. Um, we want to remind you to keep posting to the socials about all the stimulating times that you're having here. And when you do, please use the hashtag sim underscore Brisbane. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gillian Howell, and I'm very honoured to be chairing this session this morning. And we have Uncle Glenn Barry, who's our online facilitator. He's going to be staying connected with everybody who's online. So please post your comments and questions so that we can share them later. So how are we all feeling? I think by day three, we know that we've been traveling the world and an extraordinary scope of music making and social projects over the last two days. We've delved into music and health, creativity and well-being, the world of sim in the context of Oceania, detention and higher education, First, Na First Nations language revitalization, and so much more. And for those of us who are here in person, we've also been, we've laid on the floor and had beautiful sound meditation um, music to listen to and we've walked and talked by the riverside. So hopefully you've also been able to do similar things online. And we've also been very well fed and well hydrated and well caffeinated. So thank you so much to Bridie and all of the organizing team that's all run so smoothly. And thank you also to the traditional owners of the lands that we're gathering on, the Turbul and Yugara people. We thank them for their care and custodianship of this beautiful country. And I acknowledge their sovereignty here, that this is unceded Aboriginal land. So welcome everybody to the third session, which is on the theme of social impact, a third session on the theme of social impact of music making in Oceania, and our third keynote session. And I'm very honoured to be the chair for this session for our speaker, Dr. Teoti Rakana. He's a wonderful colleague and friend. The first time we met was at CMA in Corfu in 2012, and uh, uh, Teoti and I were presenting in the same session. And he opened his presentation there by saying he was from Aotearoa and he was a Maori and that the Maori people come in many different colours. And then he gave us a bit of a knowing look and said, and that's because we're very friendly people. And so from that moment, that sort of mischievous moment, I knew that this was a person who was always going to add a lot of fun and also a lot of great stories to any conference. So I was right about that, but of course he brings so much more. Um, I've gone and left the biog that I was to read for you in my bag. So I'm going to not delay by rushing over and getting it, but Teoti is an associate professor of vocal studies. and He's an opera singer. He studied in the United States. He's been training incredible voices for um, many years now in Aotearoa, and we've had the pleasure of hearing the, his singers sing at some of the different gatherings we've had for community music and sim over the years. Um, he's also the co-founder of the Decolonizing and Indigenizing Music Education uh, Special Interest Group for the International Society of Music Education. Um, he will tell us so much more about the work that he does, I know, but also get us thinking about um, the topic of norm entrepreneurship and the role of um, Indigenous people, Indigenous youth in, and musicians in particular in that important work. So Teoti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us today. Te hare mai te rangi, te hare mai, mau mau ma te ua pite mai te ra. Mau mau ma te ua pite mai te ra, ere re kotare. Ere de kotare, e ronga pu fara fara ma te fiti ma te, fiti mai te ra. Ere materua fite mai te ra, e ie, fite mai te ra, e ie, fite mai te ra, ah, ah. 
Tēnā koto e akurangi tērā. Mihi mai ki te reo o Jillian, ki te whari o tūnei tēnā koe. Ki ngā māte haere, haere, haere atūrā. Ka mihi ki te kāinga ki a Torbal rawa ko Jagera. Ka mihi ki te iwi o te whenua moi moia mai i ngā hauewha. Ki a tātou e tau nei, Ki ora koutou, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa. So, welcome to Teoti's Māori Immersion class. <laughs> so today, we need a few words to get us through the next 40 minutes. And I think, you know, this is always an interesting moment, and I'm all about language revitalization. The more you use it, the more you see it, the more it consolidates. So, some words. Mihi, I just did that, I greeted you. Mihi tanga is what we do to reach out, to greet people, to make sure that we've honored the people of the land, as well as connecting to every single person, online and off. Te reo Māori is our language, so te reo is literally the speech, or the language, or the words. Aotearoa is more more often now used for New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand. You'll notice a lot of times we will do both languages and we will always do the Māori first because we were there first. So, Aotearoa New Zealand. Everyone say Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Fantastic, I'm not going to do that again. I just wanted to see if you would. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> You're very obedient. So, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, this is a very important document I'm going to talk about a little bit later. It's our founding document and it is different from the Treaty of Waitangi. So, Pākehā is what we call the people who, who settled in New Zealand, who descended from the British Crown um, uh, settlers. Waiata, this is a word we often use for song. It's not really got the breadth that song has, I mean, that it doesn't really occupy the same space, but it, it goes further. But Waiata is the word we often use. Karakia is a blessing, and actually what I sang at the beginning was a waiata, but it was also a karakia, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Taonga puoro, it's our traditional Māori instruments. I'm always so honoured to see Uncle Glenn play. Um, you know, that's something that is really powerful in our culture. They've only come back really in the 80s and 90s, and I will talk about that also. Kaupapa Māori, this is a philosophy, a philosophy and it's our philosophy, you know, all indigenous peoples have their own sort of way of, of seeing the viewing the world. We have commonalities, but also unique moments. And for us, we apply it to lots of different situations. It's essentially saying our way of seeing the world is normal. It's just normal. It's how we see the world. And everything will be in relation to that. Um, Kohanga Reo is our immersion early childhood schools. That means language nest. Kura Kaupapa, I will bring this up also. That is our, um, our immersion schools through to the end of high school. And they're Wānanga. Quite, quite interesting, quite interesting, publicly funded tour, uh, tertiary institutions that are deliver in a Māori context and um, are alternative to mainstream. So I think that will get you through. Don't worry, I will explain these again. I don't, and I won't give you a quiz. So, First of all, thank you for the invitation to the dance. It's lovely to be here. I am honored to be here in Meijin with so many of my friends and colleagues whose work I respect and whose values I align with. Um, so I feel today I'm probably preaching to the converted, but I'm gonna preach nonetheless. I like to preach. So um, I've also been enjoying meeting so many new um, people, new voices. And I think Naomi used the word um, change agents, and I'm going to use today, just because it aligns with my theme, norms entrepreneurs, because I think it's a really interesting notion, and um, of course, that for me means um, people who are advocating uh, for new ideas and redefining appropriate behavior within their disciplinary norms, and I've heard a lot of that over the last two days. Of course, I need to thank Bridie, the biggest, baddest norms entrepreneur ever. And um, <laughs> also the only woman this queer man will always say yes to. So... <laughs> You're going to lose it, yeah. Okay, that's the only joke. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> so I am very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you all this morning and share my experiences in music and the impact of music in my life and the communities I represent. It is difficult to know what stories to share in these contexts, but today I've chosen to share some of my current obsessions, which I think coalesce into a coherent story. If not linear, I think they will coalesce into a coherent story. They are all connected to the work or the challenges. My school of music and my university, many of the governance boards and national funding boards I sit alongside or on, have been facing in decolonizing their values and their behaviors. Analyzing and unpacking disciplinary norms is something very difficult, and it has come up again and again this week um, in various ways. Um, to use another uh, great term Naomi used, I'm just stealing all her stuff, um, she used in her presentation this wonderful thing, making music at the top end of town, and that's where I make music. I'm, I'm at the top end of town. And, and it's challenging with all the challenges that that means in terms of privilege, entitlement, um, yeah, well, you know. But this is not a local dilemma, and I want to um, thank Diana Yerichuk for bringing th this to my attention and more words to my slides. Um, this is something from Dylan Robinson, who's at University of British Columbia a School of Music. Um, he wrote a great piece, open, an open letter, to all who should be concerned. And he writes, community-led change is imperative in order to avoid the replication of normative systems of music education that merely include diverse content, while curricular change and hiring of, and this is North America, so indigenous black people of color scholars, constitute one part of this change. It might also be understood as a form of additive inclusion. Models of additive inclusion proceed by placing diverse content within normative white supremacist structures, is actually what he said, of pedagogy that remain unchanged. So he suggests that rather than additive inclusion, which maintains the power of those who choose what content to include, giving over space to indigenous black people of color leadership to determine the parameters for change and to determine how foundational structures of music education should be dismantled and renewed. It's my daily business, by the way. So going on to the next slide. Our Māori Pro Vice Chancellor is Takawaho Hoskins, who wrote this with Alison Jones. They speak to a similar di dilemma in my country, in Aotearoa, and in their 22 uh, 2022 article, Indigenous Inclusion and Indigenizing the University. Um, it's here where they suggest indigenous inclusion strategies have proved inadequate for reaching equity goals and rely on Māori changing to fit a normative university mode of practice, what Kuakanen in 2007 called a benevolent form of imperialism, and suggests indigenization as a strategy. So indigenization refers, and um, I have to say that uh, a lot of First People Canadian um, scholars are writing about this very well, and it's very interesting to read. Indigenization refers not to the inclusion of indigenous people, values, and knowledge within a largely unchanged or superficially changed institutional structure, but the, to the normalization of indigenous ways of being and knowing very much aligns with what Dylan is talking about. And so today I will speak um, about participating in decolonizing processes, but I tend to use the term indigenizing because in my institution, it is an important strategy in deregulating some of the disciplinary norms that continue to plague our music departments and progress in this area. So before I go further, I will be discussing indigenous themes and immediately the question arises as to what right do I have to talk about these things? Um, what right do I have to tell these stories? And actually, I really only have the right to speak on Māori behalf, on Māori things. And the most common way to um, evidence my Māoriness is to be able to genealogically link to my ancestors, ancestral lands, tribes, sub-tribes, and to prove that I work for my people with reciprocal um, understanding of responsibilities. That's one that's often left out. There's, um, there's a price to be paid <laughs> for being part of a collective. So, um, 
I use the language wherever I can, so I put the translation up there, but I will read this in Māori because it's important that I keep using the language. So, ko nā toki matawharua, rata ko aotea ko takitumu ngā waka. Ko manga tanifa rata ko taranaki, ko te pōho o tamatia ngā maunga. Ko ngā puhi rata ko ngā si rūnui, ko taihi hau, kaitahu ngā iwi. Ko mana moka rata ko taipora anui, ko te whake te whenua. So my context is Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's just three and a half hours to the east of here, east somewhere. And we are guided by the aspirations of our funding document, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, which in brief, in the Māori version, because <laughs> there's two language versions, the Māori is the one that we, uh, we prefer. <laughs> uh, so it articulates building a nation together indigenous Māori with the British Crown, who represented the settlers we now call Pākehā, to respect and sustain the values of both communities equally in what that document suggests is a bicultural framework and built on power sharing with Māori, and Māori having sovereignty over the sustaining and development of their languages, the ownership of their lands, practices and customs. So with that, I'm going backwards, sorry, it's not linear. Um, I'm going back to the very first thing I sang, Tihore Mai. And some of you may have heard when you came in the loop soundtrack, I will share that. I will share my Spotify list with you. I think they're being requests. But um, one of the very first things that was there was Tihore Mai, very important track, and I want to speak to it. Um, that those words are ancient, and for ancient for us is different from Aboriginal, for sure. Ancient for us means that came on the canoes from the islands, so you know about 400, 800 years ago, um, and we call it Matauranga Māori. Um, it was said at an event, uh, and which is really significant, Matariki. So Matariki for us is our Māori New Year. It is significant in New Zealand because it is the only. Māori celebration that has become a national holiday. At this time, you know, we celebrate Easter, we celebrate Christmas, and for some strange reason, Guy Fawkes, but <laughs> we, we now celebrate Matariki, and it's extraordinary for us. We didn't grow up with it, but we have it now. So at Matariki, um, uh, a priest, for want of a better word, was speaking this, these ancient words, and there was a person there, Hirini Malbin, Hedini Malbin is the person, the father of the revival of our traditional instruments. He was there, and he heard it, and he set it to music. And he, um, then it became a waiata, a song of sorts, and, sorry, and he, um, it's passed down to kids, so they sing it in folk songs and all those sorts of things. I was studying in Boston at the end of the 1980s, early 90s, I'm quite old, and, he, um, my mother sent me a CD, and on the CD was um, Moana Maniapoto, one of our first uh, great pop singers who recorded in the Māori language. And the opening of that was that piece, Tuhore Mai. And it was phenomenal for me, in any case. It actually opened with the sound and Taonga Puoro, and then she came in and sang these ancient words. It was extraordinary. And uh, for me, both of those people are norms entrepreneurs because they really changed the way we looked at commercial music. And I want to sort of try and explain it here. So music created in New Zealand, that included Māori, generally started from the western end of the spectrum, and they threw splashes of exotic colour from the Māori culture on it. Um, this one started from Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, and the soundscape, and the ancient language, and then went through to the west, and added a few western things. Um, I wanted to mention that partly because it was really impactful on me. It actually shaped my doctoral dissertation. I can't remember the title of it, but it was really impactful. It was a long time ago. And um, I thought it was interesting yesterday because Georgie was speaking to resistance through music. And for me, this is an example of resistance through music, but really quietly resisting through music, which is very typical of us. I know we are lifted up as warriors, but um, no. We're passive aggressive and strategic. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it doesn't always have to be in your face. You know, it just doesn't. So anyway, <laughs> move on. 
So here are my obsessions. I'm just gonna leave that there for you to look at and then I'm gonna ramble. So, I work in the largest university in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I've taught there for over 15 years. Um, as Julia mentioned, I do coordinate the voice program. And I love classical voice. I mean, that's how I came to be. It's how I got out of New Zealand. It's how I got higher education degrees. It's how I came back to New Zealand and was able to find a place with some security um, as an indigenous Māori person in academia. Um, I love teaching classical voice. I bring a kaupapa Māori perspective to it. I mean, everything about it is the way I, I am as a Māori. And so, again, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Naomi, every meeting is sacred. And so I teach one-to-one, -one, um, kids from the age of 17 to 21, so every meeting has to be sacred. You know, they're, they're going through such interesting times from 17 to 21, and I'm there for them for four years weekly. So for me, my experience of growing up in collective and understanding responsibilities, mutual responsibilities, um, and building up those sort of that trust is implicit. So I think though, well that's important and I love it, my, my most important work is in developing community music facilitators, leaders and teachers in a colonial country <laughs> that's still searching for the post and post-colonial. So I think it is my most important work and I am passionate about it and it aligns with my core values. But some of my most interesting work happens outside of academia. So I'm on several governance boards. I'm on Sistema. That's interesting. And there's not enough time for those stories today, but that's interesting. I'm also on Prima Volta Charitable Trust, which is a regional kind of a version of Sistema, but it's about letting teenagers explore their um, unique potential within the context of song performance. So that's of course, close to my heart, that's real interesting. And then I'm on the board of Opry New Zealand. Well, that's a trip. Talk about being at the top end of town. Wow. But today's ex keynote sort of brings a lot of those experiences together um, and sort of explains why I'm interested in norms diffusion theory um, and changing and evolving norms through knowledgeable norm entrepreneurs. Um, so I think I contribute to uh, structural work in my society for sure. And as, again, Naomi says, structural work is difficult. And mine is around restoring a balance between colonizer and indigenous that has been disrupted by colonial practices and values. To use the term from Māori elder um, Moana Jackson, and somebody had Yundrup up here the other day, he was the chair of the caucus that drafted the original United um, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. So he's, he's a really important constitutional lawyer and Māori activist. He died a few years ago, but towards his, the end of his life, rather than decolonization, he advocated for the concept of an ethic of restoration, um, which is really a place-conscious term for us. It reflected his hope that as a nation, we could restore those Māori values that were damaged by colon colonization and with aroha, which is our word for love, restore respect for our wisdom traditions. So to speak to the slide, so I'm about indigenizing spaces, and I already have. <laughs> Pretty much all my protocols up until now have been for me, making me comfortable in Māori, including taking my shoes off. So it is less about adding a splash of exotic color on the colonial palette, and more about starting with a specific tone be it sound or color, that is Māori for me. Disrupting disciplinary norms, well, that's really what my work is around curriculum framework. Advocating for norms entrepreneurs. So the goal for a norms entrepreneur for me is to occupy and activate the colonial space with new, fresh behaviors that over time will become default. Um, this will take time. By the way, I'm not expecting this to happen tomorrow. This will take time. Reversing the diffusion of norms from west to rest to the rest to the west. And here I refer to Epstein's work in international relations and um, Carla Winston. There's a lot of people who's actually, I think she's local, she's, well, not so local, she's Melbourne. But there's a lot of work in international relations around this that I think is really interesting. And then, lastly but not least, rewiring non-Indigenous minds to be less reactive and more open to change, and this is where the bulk of my work is done. It's like calming people down. 
You're going, it's okay, it's okay. Um, the rewiring non-indigenous the minds. I'm just going off on a tangent. Uh, my, I have a PhD student who's in speech science. Uh, very, very brilliant science. He went from uh, a, a promising-ish tenor to music education and then to uh, voice science. And he's really fortunate. He's co-supervised with um, Johan Sundberg, which is phenomenal to have the father of science, you know, speech science there. And he went, oh my God, are you going to talk about neuroplasticity? And I was like, well, no, I'm not that science. Just, sure. But actually, the reason I came up with this is completely different. So I have a dog uh, who I shamelessly get into every presentation. Her name is May. I don't have children, so, you know. Um, but I love her deeply. She can be a bit reactive. And I was, not really seriously, but I was reading a YouTube clip. And I'm going to speak this because I was reading it. And if you read that, this is my daily encounters with colonizers, <laughs> literally. So I'm going to read it substituting dog. Please don't be offended or be offended. I don't care. Um, so <laughs> how to rewire, um, so how to rewire your reactive coloni uh, colonizers Mind for a neutral default. Thresholds are borders at the edge of a colonizer's peaceful, comfortable state. The place or time when some stimulus causes the colonizer to experience stress, anxiety, or fear. A trigger is any treasure, a stressor that occurs within the colonizer's threshold, resulting in reactive behavior. Default behaviors are whatever responses come easily to the colonizer and which are stabilizing, relaxing, and comfortable. It was phenomenal. When I sat down and read that, I went, oh my God, that's what I'm dealing with. It was spooky how all this reflected my daily encounters at the top end of town. Um, I didn't realize I was needing to retrain my colleagues, <laughs> although perhaps I did, but wouldn't have used that word. So dog trainers, they suggest that you need to identify the trigger and realize that bad behavior arises out of fear and rewire or counter condition the colonizer to real, I mean the dog, <laughs> to realize. <laughs> <laughs> to realize that the scary trigger is a predictor of wonderful things. And so for me, that's really my work. I was like, this is wonderful. Shut up. Just get on with it. Don't be afraid. And we do that through looking at norms, um, formulas, and norms, uh, and I'll explain that in just a moment. So that was a lovely. Thank you, May. I miss you. Um, so coming back to disciplinary norms, I just wanted to... Um, contextualize my university, we've been undergoing a um, curriculum transformation process. With the redesign of the curriculum framework, there have been great opportunities to shift signature pedagogies, to redesign graduate profiles, and develop hallmark experiences, I'm doing this, hallmark experiences, that potentially recondition or potentially rewire our faculty, and this includes indigenizing the curriculum. So for my colleagues at the School of Music, it has allowed us to reflect on how well we have upheld our obligations and responsibilities to the First Peoples of Aotearoa New Zealand. With all the best intentions, we have not done well. But perhaps this is because our disciplinary norms, imported from Europe, are not fit for purpose in the South Pacific. For the School of Music, the inclusion of pre-colonial values, practices, languages, and narratives in a school where the disciplinary norms have been shaped by our colonial context and inherited conservatory model of teaching is challenging. One of the dilemmas seems to be, by including local content from the communities we teach into, are we decreasing the quality and quantity of student learning needed to be successful in our field? Deciding what is essential for students to gain proficiency in an area of study, and I mean, it's a job for an expert teacher in that field, for sure. However, as Foucault notes, the norms of the field may operate within a set of unacknowledged natural rules, described by Epstein as a set of internalized prescriptions that are experienced as chosen. She explains that this is the power of norms, that they can be taken for granted and unquestioned. At the end of the day, that's what we do. my department is questioning those norms. Yeah. Show us the evidence. So, oh, it's over there. I don't know why I keep doing that. So, one of the most frequently cited definitions of norms, and many of you may those know this if you're sociologically in inclined, is that um, offered by Finnamore and Sikink, which is a standard of appropriate behavior for actors within a given identity. Or for my purposes today, 
I prefer the one beneath. They, um, they are shared rules and expectations that define the values of a group and shape the interactions and behaviours of that group. So arguably this is one of the most um, studied topics in contemporary international relations. Scholars in that field identify, describe and analyse the emergence, diffusion, evolution and effect of norms in the international system. And generally this is used for big world problems like climate change, human trafficking legislation, but when mapped onto the disciplinary norms of classical music, arguably a big world problem, uh, there is potential for more sustainable sociocultural change and innovation in schools of music. I also suggest that in colonial contexts, norms unmoderated can perpetuate suppressive power dynamics. But again, probably preaching to the converted, but I, just, I need to say that. So, stories of my land, okay. So I'm gonna try and do this quite quickly because it's interesting, but you know, many of you already know this. For in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, for Māori, our modern story begins with our relationship to the British Crown, and as I said, through the historic treaty document, Te Tiriti o Waitangi. So there are two language versions, and they don't mean the same thing. For Māori, from the Māori perspective, um, Te Tiriti suggested they would be guaranteed the possession of their lands and um, supported in the development of their languages and all of their cultural practices and retain self-sovereignty. Together with the Crown, they will build a nation and work towards the implementation of those aspirations. The English versions, however, ceded all rights and powers of sovereignty to the Crown. Full stop. So, re resolving the impact of this fundamental misrepresentation of intent, I will say that again because that's a good sentence, resolving the impact of this fundamental misrepresentation of intent is the central story of our land. So it pervades all sectors of our society. And interestingly enough, while education had its role to play in suppressing Māori language and cultural practice, it is in that area recently where it has been key to fulfilling the aspirations of our early Māori leaders, which was to retain a secure Māori identity while embracing Western values and beliefs. So um, it was wonderful to see the language revitalization yesterday. I'm so there with you. Um, Language revitalization has been a huge part of our story. Huge part of our story. Um, about 30 years ago, the key drivers to our academic search, and there has been an academic search in Māori, were something called organic policies. That was a, a very old Māori, they termed it like that. They were gatherings of hui um, from various places of Māori from across, across the land, so it was intertribal, but also intergenerational and um, mixed gender. And one of the concerns for them was uh, the loss of language and the dying of the language. And so they took control of education. They just took control of it. And the Ministry of Māori Development at that time supported them. Out of that came our te kohangareo. So this is in the 70s, by the way. So it's, it's, we've been working hard at this for a long time. Um, kohangareo, which were our Māori language nests I mentioned, um, Kura Kaupapa and Whare Kura and Wananga. They're all Māori immersion, Māori uh, culture learning places. Um, adding to this was the work of Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, who, which is the Māori, uh, Māori Centre of Research Excellence. It was under the co-guidance of Linda Tuhawai Smith. I think Ivy mentioned it her the other day. Um, uh, who is, yeah, okay, the seminal book, but also a phenomenal woman, with uh, Michael Walker. So they, um, they set an initial goal of graduating 500 Māori doctoral scholarships, scholars, excuse me, uh, through something called MAI, the Māori and Indigenous Scholar Network. Um, and this was achieved in a five-year period. Uh, and then they sent a new benchmark of about 1,500, and I think they've graduated 800 since then. Um, that was between 202 and 207, by the way. So they're really entrenched in our academic, uh, our academic sites and our high schools, and actually internationally. So I want to make that relevant to you guys here in Australia, particularly. We are a population of only 5.1 million, and Māori are 17.2%. So we're talking about 800 to 900 
thousand Māori. So it's significant, and it has been really uh, important in our development, but it has not happened overnight. To fully appreciate, however, the musical history of Aotearoa in New Zealand, I meander slightly off topic. Here, this picture at the bottom, some of you may recognize it, may not. It is from Jane Campion's 1993 movie, The Piano, with Holly Hunter. And uh, a mute woman arrives with her daughter in New Zealand, and they leave all of her stuff there, including a grand piano. So what's interesting about this is this historically accurate. The settlers that came to New Zealand came with their grand pianos. It's phenomenal, and it's really interesting. Um, that sort of reveals the, the class and the role music played in their lives. Adams, however, uh, refers to the scene as the image of a grand piano on a deserted beach as an alien intruder. <laughs> um, but also ag agrees its testimony to the personal and cultural value of the instrument. However, like the piano, the classical music disciplinary norms, and in fact, the music disciplinary norms, migrated to Aotearoa with these European settlers. The collateral damage of that really, aligning with other global stories, including here, um, is that my community's practices were and are occasionally still cast as inferior to the inherited music traditions of the West. Again, the, just to come back to Foucault, the unacknowledged natural um, rules that have become normalized in our discipline. Kihano suggests that we might need to delink from this anchor of Eurocentrism and restore the status and mana of the music that existed in the land before the European settlers arrived. And so that's my goal. So let's come to this norm simple structure. So to facilitate changing, I'm so sorry I've got a model, I've got two model pictures, I'm just apologizing to the people who are tired of models, because um, <laughs> I've, I've heard whispers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to facilitate changing our values and practices in the School of Music, it is useful to understand how disciplinary norms unknowingly impact our thoughts and decisions around curriculum and develop a model that can achieve our desired outcome. So Carla Winston, again, I, I love her work. She supports this approach and suggests a problem can often be resolved by examining the structure of the norms themselves. So this is just an example, but she, she says the norms have a three-part structure consisting of a problem, which is an issue to be addressed, a value, a belief about how something should be done, and a behavior, the action to be taken to address the given problem and allows the participant to achieve the value. So while this visual representation, representation here of this norm structure is quite simple, um, it sort of starts the conversation for us like, I could have brought this, and I'm going to talk about a hui in a minute, and there were significant people there, and I mentioned this to them. Our value, we value the aspirations of Tiriti Waitangi, but the problem is uh, we have a Eurocentric music curriculum, so what are the behaviors that need to happen? And it sort of allows our head of schools to just sort of think about it. This is too simple, obviously. Um, Winston um, suggests another version, a theoretical, um, uh, an innovative theoretical um, uh, model called the norms cluster. And I love the way she talks about this. I haven't given you an example of that today because I wanted to give you another example, but um, the norms cluster is a multiple combination of conceptually intellect but distinct values and behaviors. So really it just means there's a list. Um, and they offer multiple acceptable solutions to similar and interlocking problems. So you can choose which one is relevant to you, which one you're going to prioritize. I think the fact that there's choice is really important and is, is one of those spaces where you can negotiate it. We're not saying you do this, this, and this. We're saying this could happen, and then this could happen, or this could happen, and this could happen. So that's, I think, a more mm, satisfying discussion for talking about how you're going to change dis disciplinary norms. But if the model needs to be made explicit, the norms that perpetuate suppressive power dynamics then need to align with what Dylan Robinson was talking about. And perhaps the model should be designed by those who have been marginalized or left out of the discussions. Maybe they should take the lead in their own country in determining the parameters for change and determining how foundational structures of music education should be dismantled and renewed. In this case for us, it's Māori music educators. So I'm going to move now to, um, I'm going to ramble for a moment. 
I think I'm doing really well with time. That's amazing. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a hui that happened a few weeks ago with the Remedy Project. We were hosting them in Auckland at the Creative uh, Center for Arts and Social Transformation. Um, so they came in to share their findings. And I invited a panel of young Māori researchers who recently graduated from the Mai Network and um, sort of finding their way in the world, and they'd done research and they wanted to share their research. So they, they had PhDs. I then also invited strategically my head of school <laughs> um, and the music education people from my office, and then a whole bunch of other people. But they weren't allowed to talk. <laughs> they had to sit around and listen. Ooh. Um, and they did it. And what we had really were six, um, sorry, um, sorry, Christy, I keep thinking you as indigenous and you're not, but you nonetheless had a lot to offer. It was wonderful. It was Christy, oh, Christy went up here. Um, oh, yeah, there you are, yeah. Uh, so we had um, indigenous talking to indigenous, which is really important. We don't have much time to sort of talk and reflect on our work with each other. So that was happening, and that was wonderful. But then also, and I'm just going to talk to these Māori researchers, you know, I, um, what I liked about them was that they were able to sort of give us a key into another norm structure, one that they would suggest from their kaupapa Māori worldview. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, it was more, um, I guess, ontologically um, focused into the, the, the Māori worldview, and that was really important for me. I, we, I just don't have that opportunity. So they brought up the problem of using the term music within the Māori creative dimension. <laughs> and I mean, I, I talk about music as not being siloed into music, music and dance, you know, but they really went deeper. Music as a European concept ontologically seems too narrow. They argue that the breadth of knowledge needed to access that creative dimension and express it through music extends well beyond the parameters of Western Euro European interpretation of the term. Music interconnects with multiple knowledge systems within our cultural practices, and is more diverse in form and purpose. And I thought it was a really interesting notion to bring up, and brave. Uh, they, I'm gonna, oh, there she they, all three of them, so this is what they came up with as a kapapa Māori norms uh, practice. They all strongly connected Māori music to kōrero tuku iho, which are our oral traditions and story making. All three shared experiences from their research that contextualized our narratives, musical and otherwise, as our way of sharing and remembering our current and past histories. Stories that tell us our values and how we should behave in order to achieve norms expected by us and our communities. They pointed out that we had no written language before colonization, so this added value to our oral traditions. Our ancestors valued our stories as taonga, positions that were important to carry with us through life and from place to place. So when evolving the disciplinary norms offered in the School of Music, this more representative collective, <clears throat> their understanding of music, Māori music, invites us to consider rewriting the assumptions about the purpose of Māori music, as well as creating content that illustrates a deeper, more Māori understanding of Māori concepts stories that have been historically reported within the confines of Western theory form and analysis. So why was this composition created? What's its purpose and being? Um, so again, the values, the values are very Māori. It's starting from the Te Ao Māori side of that little image I showed before and heading towards the West not starting from the West and going, ooh, let's add a few things to be strategic. <laughs> there you go. Um, so just to move on, sorry, I, I mean, that's probably enough of that. I finally, <laughs> shall I give you a definition of norms entrepreneurs? It's about time. We're at the end of it. So I think norm, norms entrepreneurs are important, but in colonial context, indigenous norms entrepreneurs with one foot in the pre-colonial world and one in the Western world are very useful. Finnamore and Sinkin um, claim norm entrepreneurs are a catalyst for norm emergence. They are entrepreneurs advocating new ideas 
and redefining appropriate behavior within their disciplinary norms. They attempt to alter others' assumptions by offering alternative worldviews and possibilities. So in our context, or in my context, to make curriculum fit for purpose with the, um, with the values in the kaupapa Māori version, I believe effective norm entrepreneurs should have the knowledge to guide music higher education in a colonial context. In addition, they need credibility <clears throat> that has lived experience of both Western and Māori knowledge systems and to speak with authority across a range of culturally based issues. They should have the capa um, capability to rewire global minds by ideating outside the box of music norm disciplinary norms. This may mean some people with conventional training may need to tap out and make room for musicians with different knowledge sets. But that's another discussion. <laughs> And I put myself in there too. I'm a Maori brought up in the culture, educated in America, but before the organic policy. And it's getting to the point now where I see these young ones and I go, mm, mm, I made the room, I made the space, bye. I'm gonna go live with my golden retriever. So, um, I feel hopeful for schools of music in higher learning education uh, higher institutions, because I think here, particularly in the global south, we are far enough away from the nexus of traditional conservatoire training to confidently shift down disciplinary norms. Um, just to respond to, again, the question that happened, I think it was on Claire in your session about where does it belong, you know, does it belong here? Um, I believe music that is socially impactful and the training of musicians that will go forth and heal communities through music making belongs in higher schools of music and arguably should be the center of what we do. That is what our department is committed to. Um, so fortunate. Placing our discipline geographically in the South Pacific and valuing the sensibilities that are relevant to our student cohort, not values entrenched in the elite traditions of 19th century conservatory training. I, I don't think this is radical, I think it's sensible. We have recently taken the Te Reo Māori name, <laughs> and it goes in front of the School of Music because we came first. So it is Te Whare Ngā Pūkorero Pūoro, the School of Music. It means the home of musical storytellers. Yeah, right? So that's not enough to decolonize, but you know, um, it is a beginning. It's a realization that our purpose and our roles are changing. So I want to leave it there, except I have one video to show, which is two minutes, all good? All good, yeah, okay. So this is because um, we're changing disciplinary norms. I've been talking about conservatory and, and um, higher education. But actually, I want to talk about changing disciplinary norms for Māori in our most important kapaka genre, our performance genre called kapahaka. It's really important. And we've been changing disciplinary norms there as well, but um, in a really different way. <laughs> Mm. Um, so kapahaka occupies multitude of spaces. For those who are involved in social justice, um, it, 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 we have a kapahaka competition for women and men in prisons. It's been extraordinarily rehabilitative because it's connecting Indigenous Māori with um, the culture and the language, which often is the reason they are there. They are disconnected. But it also has been really useful for our rainbow community, particularly transgender. Um, we have really strongly defined gender roles in, in our culture, but they're very, uh, as with many indigenous, that they have happened since Christianity came, and they're not always authentic. So we've been sort of redistributing those gender roles within kapahaka groups um, with transgender. But the one I'm gonna show you, coming back to my point, there was reason for me doing this, is because um, poi is traditionally a woman's uh, kapaka tool. And actually that's not true. Men did it um, to get suppleness and to prepare for war. And in a competition a few years ago, um, they said uh, there, there was a boys' school doing poi. And they said, no, you can't do it. You've got to replace it with weaponry, otherwise you will be disqualified. So they, um, <laughs> they responded, and this is how they responded. If, and so I wanted to give an example of another discipline, but also resistance through music.
ora, kia ora. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teoti. I'm sure we have many questions, but first I'd like to welcome Sandy Sir to the podium. He's um, our respondent. Um, Sandy is from Vanuatu, and I believe there's a slide. Yeah, great. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Sandy. Um, I'm from Vanuatu. Um, just before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional honors of this land that I stand on. Uh, to respond to Teoti, um, I would say I was given a name in New Zealand as a chief when I represent Vanuatu with the ladies, with the uh, Maori, to, uh, to the um, grand opening of the Falcon Bay in uh, state of Florida, Orlando, Disneyland, and um, I was given a talk. And after that talk, the chief that leads the, the Maori uh, gave me the name of Maori and a title. So I'm glad that I'm responding. <laughs> uh, so uh, culture speak a lot, but just the way how we drive our culture. And um, through music is one thing that I believe. Um, can turn things around, but in a form that how we drive music is important. And um, the foundation that I did, I start the organization Lewaton Cultural Experience based on the word of music. And um, I've done my research on that. And um, I found out that this is the way forward because the water becomes an instrument and water speaks for us and for our lovely Mother Earth and everything on this universe, what to speak. With all this music, on sounds, that create a platform that our universe is surviving and humans are surviving with water. So I always call water is medicine, water is um, surgical, water is operational, operational, and the pharmacy, when we go to the hospital, all this we receive is the same thing with music, you just take music and look for things that can heal. Because when I relate my work back to our language, language is our, our identity, which is tell us everything, every single thing is from nature. And that nature is one thing that gives us life as human, everything we preach from nature. So one of the platforms that is um, the way to way forward for me, for my community, for my people, from where I come from, um, Vanuatu is made out of 83 islands all together, and now it's all included with little islands that uh, is counted into to form Vanuatu, a group of islands. To protect the water, to protect the nature, we use this uh, water music, the water drumming, and the ladies travel with me to, to do that grand opening in uh, Orlando. Uh, Disneyland, with the Volcano Bay, and we were among this uh, family from New Zealand, and that's when I get my rank, what I did, chief from the people, and I was honored in front of the, C the three CEO of the Disneyland, and uh, it was an honor for me, so I'm glad that I'm responding to Brother Jody this morning. And like I said, water is a nature. Echo is a nature. And weather is a nature. And everything weave to get together so that to sustain the life. But inside, there's already music. There's already something happening. The sounds that comes out, it's already music. So humans stepped in just to harmonize the, 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 the sound and present it in the form of human for the nation of the world, of the world to see, and strengthen the the life in our nature and human. Um, you can see how we dress. 
The tracing that we do is identify the connections and to uh, look after both sides, the nature of the water and the nature of the environment. So that can help us to um, look after the sun, the ecosystem, as well as human life cycle in the, uh, in the environment. Um, it is really important too with uh, the way we introduce the water music because the water himself already speak, like I said. It's all connected. The song line is going through the water really fast. And the way we manage that is, when I studied this, I studied the water music before I started. I started with five songs for the ladies to start playing that songs. And we listen to the nature, the creatures that they're talking, and then we put into the water drumming and create that sound. And from there, from five, we go beyond five, and now we have more than five. So we know where we're going, and today, uh, the water music is across the globe, working with um, other people around the world, uh, doing their research on water music as well. And I'm standing here at the broad band of Vanuatu to be the first person doing the research work on the water music. And I think that's the way forward for our um, nation, but not the nation, or the nation of the Melanesian. Um, to use that to help everyone in the room and our Mother Earth and communities in the way of understanding the importance of the environment into music, into the life cycle of the human life, and communities and individuals. Um, in that note, I would like to say, because the word, like the language says, music, in our, my language, it said, nes. The music, it's the word that music, it's nes. So, put this together, we just put the word that come in and become the instrument that we use to our nes, and nes in life, which is nes. So that's how it works for me. So you get five things, you put into three things, you make 10 things. <laughs> 10 lives working. So that's why it's always important that the shape of our body, the organization that I start, I think only Naomi see this, and um, you can Google up the, the website to make it the easiest for the kids to see or to understand I set up the, the village or the, uh, the organization by putting, like you said, they have got a special hat, the, what's the name? I forgot now. Nakama, whatever the house, uh, Vare. So it's called Vare. For us, it's Gemel. And we got Ayang. There's two houses. So we're sitting in here. We have two houses in here. We got ladies and men. I was raised inside the men's hut. And I got my mom and sister that were raised inside Ayang. Ayang means a mother that owns everything before he goes out there and starts talking, doing things. And it's the same for us as men. To be a man, you have to be inside that nakama, that vare, that we call remel. Remel means the foundation before you start singing that word nees and become nees. So you start singing es because is. So es is life. And es is a song. So that's the language. How the language speaks for us and it's really strong. And that's how I set up the, um, the actual performance area. Because we can sing and talk, but if they don't see the structure, then it's going to be a while to get them through the, um, the live teaching. So I only have five minutes. To protect all this, I, I start to strengthening my organization by using the community, family, to tell them to protect the environment. So we collect plastic and we make purses. We weave them into purses. To set that ecosystem, 
because that contributes into our human life. So we collect the waste plastic bags. So we use the kids, the ladies, and they go and collect the plastic, and the ladies stay with them. And it becomes a place. That's where you put your ecosystem in. When you have some money in there, it makes a noise. <laughs> so you know you're still alive. All right? So that's my short presentation. Thank you so much. What up? Uh, thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, we are very, we're right, right on time, but we'd love to have invite a question. I can see there's a question. Uh, I'm sorry, bad lighting, but please, because I can't see who it is. It's Candace. Thank you. She, Candace is on her way down. Uh -oh. <laughs> Candace Kruger from uh, Griffith University. Okay. Um, we're going to face this direction. Eyes um, I'm going to call an ancestral blessing from over the country. Wegamala, we're calling to the past. Then I'm calling to the Burley Mountain, Yabrong, who came across the waterways and settled down there, bringing brothers from a mother country. And we pay respects to seven sisters who look after us all across all of our countries, across our waterways. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Candice. Um, we are now going to go to our morning tea break. And thank you so much to all the people who made this such a beautiful opening for our third day. See you very soon. <laughs>